And for folks who don't know, the Free State Project is a movement of voluntary human action where we are trying to concentrate libertarians in the state of New Hampshire. I think we've got done uh, more in the last decade than every other libertarian movement combined has accomplished in the last five decades. Are my friends and my neighbors who are willing to stand against tyranny, make their voices heard, and have a goddamn impact. You have a problem with too many people are afraid to say what they believe in, but it'll actually do something about it. If you're afraid to stand outside the TSA line and piss off 97% of people who are waiting just to take the arm dildo up their ass for five seconds, then you're probably not ever going to make the change. Free State Project, again, it's, it's 1% of the Free State Movement. I am a friend of the Free State Project. And would you encourage people to check and, it out? Absolutely. Check it out. Find out. If you like it, join us. Continue the effort. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, libertarians, anarchists, movers, natives, and those on your way, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Free State Live, where you can learn all about the ways you can live free and thrive in the free state of New Hampshire. First and foremost, welcome back our host. As always, I'm Justin O'Donnell, host of the Subversive Podcast, live every Tuesday night, and former libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate in the great state of New Hampshire. And joining me, as always lately, our resident internet keyboard warrior, Kevin from the internet. How are you, Kevin? Good, good, good. Glad, st- glad to still be be on the show. Hey, let's I keep mean, it going. Back again, let's keep it going. And also <laughs> back again, uh, we have, I'd hate to say he's a stand-up comedian because it's quite a jump from the floor to seven feet tall, but Peter of all things California, Bill Barker. How are you? Hey, Bill? what's happening? Are you guys drinking your water today? Absolutely. It's been like 100 degrees today, so it's been... Uh, I'm not built for this. I'm a winter kind of a guy myself. So I've been drinking all day and still coughing. It's terrible. Um, but our special guest for the night, fresh from the left coast, recent mover, and soon to be star studded freedom fighter and activist extraordinaire, I'm sure, Ben Weir. How are you, Ben? What's up, guys? I'm doing well, and I'm drinking water too, but it's actually water done whiskey. It's scotch on ice. Yeah, well, there you go. Oh, I got beer as well. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for joining, Ben. And it's been interesting. I think this is a timely time to have a new mover on tonight to talk about motivations and reasons for moving, as well as uh, in, like perceptions of and kind of your takes of when you got here, because there was a big news story today. And I don't think if a lot of people yeah. caught the news story, it kind of got brushed under the rug. Um, but our frosty neighbors to the north took a major step towards eliminating the last vestiges of individual liberty and freedom within the communist landscape of California by announcing a new sweeping unilateral complete and utter ban on possession, sale, transfer, or ownership of any handgun in the nation of Canada, as pronounced by oh, Herr Trudeau. Oh, Canada did that? Canada did that unilaterally oh. today in response to a school shooting in Texas. I didn't know that. What they don't talk about it is kids in Canada who die in schools don't die in school shootings. They die at the hands of their teachers and only if they're native. But that's another story for another (laughs) time. Um, The problem is we've seen American progressives and leftist governors and politicians from all over the U.S. clamoring and begging for a similar response from U.S. politicians. And, well, who knows if anybody's going to step up to the plate and try and do something as depraved and unnatural as deny their citizens the very right to basic self-defense that they're entitled to, it's going to be California. <laughs> I completely agree with you there. Like, I I, I can't even uh, explain how incredible it is to finally have, like, my gun rights back. Um, like, <laughs> I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, lived in Colorado, which is California 2.0 at this point. But being in California for, like, almost five years for work, it is like uh it's a night and day difference i like got my paper id and the same day walked into a gun store here and walked out with a gun like i haven't been able to do that in years so it felt really good but uh yeah california they are and they're trying to pass more gun legislation right now like it's not looking good so I had the very same day I moved to New Hampshire. I got my paper ID, walked into a gun store very first day, exactly the same, purchased a firearm. But then again, part of the whole reason I moved was a disagreement with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over what constituted a legal firearm. And they took a whole bunch of shit from me, so I had to replace it. Um, But that also, on my way home from the gun store, I got pulled over going 100 miles an hour in a 60 and only got a warning. New Hampshire's a great place. (laughs) (laughs) 
So Ben, so ben yo, uh, Bill, uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say. So you did you you grew up in California, right? No. So I mean, oh, no? fifteen years in Pennsylvania, ten years in Colorado, five years in California. I literally it was only there because I got a really cool job there. Um, but uh, it it I mean, it, was, it, it got to the point where I was like, um, money wasn't enough to keep me there. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I need to experience the life I was like that we're all meant to live like it, it's it's um there's a lot of freedom fighters in California and in, in the libertarian party and, and they're trying to do a lot of good things um amazing people but it's difficult man like I I'm telling you like northern California is uh, usually pretty rural but like it's as everybody knows the whole state's politics is dictated by Sacramento San Francisco LA and and um, it causes everybody outside of those cities to suffer, like their horrible well, policies. That, that's an interesting thing I, I want to ask you about and talk about. A lot of people, when they move to New Hampshire, it's kind of their first taste of freedom, and it's their first taste of activism and getting involved in liberty movement. They're academic. They've read about liberty. They read Rothbard. They've gone to Freedom uh, Fest, Pork Fest, whatever, but they've never actually tried to fight for it where they are. Um, they've just kind of recognized the lost cause it is moved to New Hampshire. You were very involved in the Libertarian Party of California and trying to fight to roll back the authoritarian regime in California. What would you say kind of the differences in what you've seen since you've been in New Hampshire from maybe the ease of that fight, the worthwhileness of that fight, and the general mood around that fight and around that mission compared from California to New Hampshire? So I'll say that... Uh here in new hampshire everybody kind of just we're on like a, a one-track mind and at least like you know the libertarian other libertarians i met like we're on a one-track mind to get liberty in our lifetime in our community to secede and then decentralize it even more in california they're just like trying not to get canceled by their own jobs for saying something bad on twitter <laughs> like it's it's at that point you know what i mean like I, that's i i I want to say that there is like, what's the point in trading blue flavored authoritarianism for red flavored authoritarianism? Cause it's still just authoritarianism at the end of the day. But, and uh, there's a lot of red authoritarianism in, in, in blue in this state of New Hampshire, it's an amazing state, but I mean, that still exists here, but I'll tell you what, like the amount of like, nationalists essentially the california nationalists is what i would say like they are trying to protect their homeland and be the example for the country what happened in canada today like i can almost guarantee that's going to happen in california in 10 years or less like i i can almost promise you just because of the way things are going politically and the legislation that's trying to be passed through with all the um second amendment stuff i mean we'll see like the ninth circuit it has a lot of cases on the table right now to uh like try to overturn the like magazine ban or the handgun roster which if you didn't know there's probably thousands of different types of pistols that you could possibly buy and you can only get 50 of them in california like they have to be california client macro stamped like it's uh, there's so many rules with it and then every time they add one to the roster by law they have to take off three so eventually it's going to get down to like 10 or less pistols you're even allowed to own in that state. And it's going to be a high point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I, yeah. I like guns. You can't tell. I'm going to take it. <laughs> so what, what was it like? So being in California, what, you were in uh, what part of California? I was in the Sacramento area, right outside of Sacramento. Okay. Um, so the capital city. I actually... Um, put together a anti-war rally at the Capitol building there on 9-11 this last year, um, nice. which was pretty cool. It did get covered by a few news outlets. Um, and uh, we had and, uh, Adam Kokesh speak, Angela McArdle, the new LNC chair, and uh, Jeff Hewitt, who's a supervisor in Riverside, California. Okay. And so and so, how, what, was there like a good, strong community of libertarians out there or what? So that's, that is a huge difference. There is a lot of libertarians in California. We make up like over 10% of all the libertarian parties, um, members, but, um, New Hampshire is so much more concentrated because it's a smaller state 
And where I was in like the top third of the state, essentially, it would take me like six hours to make it from Sacramento to the northern border of the state. So everything's so spread out like the, it's it's yeah. absolutely, you know what I mean? It's, it's harder to get libertarians together, I guess, when they're further away. But um, that was one of my missions. Like I helped to um, establish some county affiliates in northern California. So that way they would actually have a place to go meet up and talk about all things liberty. You know, like I feel like that's been a big flaw of the Libertarian Party in general is that people are libertarians in name only, right? Linos. Yeah. And they don't have anything that they can go to and meet other libertarians. They're just going to be like voting libertarians. But the real Correct. strengths that we have here in New Hampshire is that everything's closer. Um, we have these meetups and like there are tons of activists here. You know what I mean? Like there's all these free staters coming into the state like myself that aren't just like passively moving to vote the right way. Like we're trying to like actually change the entire regime. You know what I mean? Like we're here to make a difference and change this uh, state. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, oh, there's, there's a oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Oh, 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 I didn't know who got muted. Um, I, muted. Uh, so, My dog uh, <laughs> um, I was going to say, so <clears throat> how much of that did went into like, or how you fell into the Free State Project or came to the Free State Project, having been in California and done so much work, having been in Colorado previously, Pennsylvania previously, um, you know, what what do you find is something, like what drove you to New Hampshire or the Free State Project in particular, where you could have picked any other state or some of the places you previously had been? Okay, so, I mean, I'm not scared of cold, first of all. Pennsylvania and Colorado get pretty cold. They get plenty of snow, that's for sure. Um, I do have a lot of family in the Northeast scattered throughout. Um, but I would say, um, you know, I actually started looking into the Free State Project a very long time ago. Um, I was like, oh, like this is, this is cool, but, like, is it going to work? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I heard about it, like, you know, five, ten years ago. Uh, not, not quite 10 years ago, but um, I was like, I, I started looking into it again when I was out there in California and I had this idea, like the northern third of California is called the state of Jefferson, right? What if we did like a free Jefferson project and just concentrated all our libertarian strength in the northern part of California? And I was looking at the free state project as like a role model for that right because it, it, it's been working for the last several years <laughs> and uh and then i'm like well crap like yeah we can take over as many counties as we want right there's actually like eureka california would be a great place for libertarians to take over because there's like a, a port there like we can well, be if not for the culture of eureka california <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes exactly you know so, that I mean, go ahead go ahead no you're at, you're absolutely right but you know there came a point where i was like I could just move somewhere and just be free. Like this is not, this is like it, California will be an unending fight. I can almost guarantee you it's going to be one of the first states to secede if that ever passes. Like I want to, I want it to be New Hampshire, but I can almost promise you the reason California is going to want to leave is to get rid of like basically the more conservative leaning um, swings that they have. You know what I mean? So they're that's just my opinion obviously like they've already tried to do like these calexic things like three or four times split the state up into three or four different states already um the talk is very popular out there um as popular probably as it is here um and is that the difference the whole... is you have democrats that actually want to secede <laughs> like that's Not a there. big yeah. amount of people oh wow so that's no, it's really interesting. Um, um, my show. One of my early guests that I had on my show was Louis Marinelli, the founder of Cal Exit and president of the Cal Exit. He ran for governor on a platform of California seceding from the union, and I had invited him on. I wanted to talk to him, and I was assuming that he was pro secession, so he must be a libertarian. We're going to get along, have a lot to uh, agree upon. And an hour later, I'm like, all we did was argue. We didn't agree <laughs> on anything except for the fact that California shouldn't be part of the United States. Yes. Like, but no, and, no. And going through that whole process of like, like I wrote an entire executive summary of what I would want to present to people if they were interested. Right. Like I got pretty far into it and like, 
I got to a point where my rent was was uh, needing to be renewed, or you know, my lease was needing to be renewed, and um, I just started looking. I was like, if there's anywhere to move, where would it be? Like, I'm just like, where would I want to go? New Hampshire was the top option for me, and I, I asked my wife if there was any state in the world you could want to go to. Like, if, like you had to choose a place, where would you want to go? she started looking things up she took like a week and she gave me a list and new hampshire was on a list i didn't tell her anything i didn't like you know what i mean but happy wife happy That's life cool. you know what i mean so uh <laughs> eventually we went here to visit um and when was um, that in december and then okay. at the end of january i came out to attend the libertarian party convention which i got snowed in for and i couldn't even go to but i get here get offered a job and Two days later, I had a house offer accepted, and the next day, I had my home inspection already done. It's like it was meant to be. So, it was absolutely crazy. And in a month and a half later, middle of March, I actually ended up moving into the town of Pittsfield here. So, um, it's cool. been a really cool journey so far. So, yeah, that's super quick, especially with the market, the housing market, what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so easy to find a job, but not a place to live. <laughs> You've been here three months, right? Almost three months. Yeah, yeah, uh, about three months now. What's 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 your the best thing you've got involved with that you like to do? Um, I'm trying to help out the uh, you know, as Jeremy Kaufman, he's running for Senate. Uh, I'm trying to help out as his events coordinator. So I've been uh, trying to have some every couple of weeks for him to be going to and, and speaking at. Um, I am trying to get, I've got a lot of things in store. Like this weekend's the Southern New Hampshire Libertarian Party Affiliates Convention. Um, as far as I know, I'm the only person with my name on the board to be a uh, the chair. So I'm probably gonna end up being the chair and I have a three-year plan already laid out. Like I've, I've got a lot of plans for Southern New Hampshire to kind of organize and uh, finally become the force that we should be like we, the pro the biggest problem with new hampshire is the fact that we don't have ballot access yet so it's really hard to collect data like it's very hard you need to have a system in place um at least for snhlp it doesn't like exist because it's still like a new thing it's kind of like you know growing in, in um, an idea at this point um my goal is to prove that by having these smaller affiliates we can complement the state party of the libertarian party and uh grow in our number of libertarians bring people into the party you know table events such as they just had a um a gun show in concord that would have been a great one to go to um but once again just creating another atmosphere where libertarians or liberty-minded people freedom fighters can go to and gather and be heard because that's like the the biggest thing people need like the free state project has well, every day of the year they have an event going on basically you know what i mean where a lot of libertarians i want to be somebody actively creating moments where people can get together share and talk about liberty fight for freedom um and talk about things that really matter like like the defend the guard bill there's no reason that can't pass here in new hampshire if it's pitched the right way so um that's that's a big next step for me too i'm going to try well, to uh, you mentioned the gun show in concord yeah. i was at the gun show in concord this weekend and uh just a quick little uh side note here you talk about how much the gun culture of new hampshire was kind of like attractive to somebody coming from california who loves guns the gun culture in new hampshire is so attractive and so non-partisan and crosses political lines i was utterly shocked at the number of people at this gun show who were wearing masks and wearing shirts about being vaccinated and like it was mind-blowing um and there was outright political debates happening in the middle of the gun show on the floor people arguing over the like politics about whether or not it's the new new uh is awful or great needs to be reelected. but at the, at the same time then they're haggling over the ar-15 on the table about who can make a better offer and like Democrats sitting there trying to buy knives and handguns off of dealers and getting mad uh, that they're getting outbid. It's mind blowing. 
absolutely crazy because like uh, i know that you were there to like you know help get petitions and stuff were right. you walking around inside did they actually let you inside to do that or was no it not inside? inside to do it also yeah because free I, zone inside yeah i i called them the other week to see if we could petition to get signatures for ballot access and they said no you cannot do that here because we don't want to be involved with politics and i said that's why you're losing <laughs> you know what i mean like you there's nothing more political right now than protecting our gun rights and republicans constantly are negotiating these rights away the libertarian party is the absolute best and most principled party when it comes to uh gun rights and gun protections right um you know like it blew my mind he said i don't want to get involved with the politics i was like dude you're in the middle of it you're hosting a gun show. Let's do it. <laughs> Come it's, on. It's, it's political in its nature. Right. Right. So. Cannot oh. avoid it. So well, since you've been here, and this is one thing I like to ask all new movers, everybody comes with their expectations and kind of like a preconceived notion and understanding of what they're getting into, what they're expecting from the free state project, um, maybe some kind of image we even try to portray with shows like this and some of the media we produce. What have been some things that you found surprising or uh, maybe weren't prepared for or kind of took you off guard when you got here that maybe somebody who is considering moving should be aware of in your mind before they move i'll tell you people have heard of the free state project it's usually a very far left socialist democrat <laughs> and they probably hate you or you have like you know like some people who just like don't know what the free state project is like my coworkers had no idea and they were like but that's cool like you're here to like help us out with like protecting these freedoms that we've got and i was like that's exactly why we're here. So uh, they w actually were very welcoming of that um, because the whole culture here kind of breathes that like live free or die mentality. I mean, outside of like Nashua, Manchester, like probably even like Concord for sure. But, I, you know, the culture here is is so much more what I was expecting it to be than, you know, like I, I come here expecting it to, you know, just be like, you know, like free right but like it's really in the culture here like they really truly want to preserve their freedoms um at least most of them do and um i, I felt extremely welcomed by non-free staters and especially by free staters um like there's i've been to you know eight to ten different events since i've been here i try to go at least every week to every other week uh to something where i can get together and um uh, just you know either relax or talk about rolling back the state a little bit. You know what I mean? So um, it's it's been everything I wanted it to be and more. Uh, and, and honestly, it's so green outside and, and warm outside right now. It's uh, It feels like I'm back in my homeland. You know what I mean? In California, <laughs> it's like 100 degrees every day, basically. You know, 95 degrees all last week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's our state's not New Hampshire's not on here. fire. That, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. It's not on yeah. fire. There's a lot of green everywhere and it's beautiful. It's probably yeah. like no, it's not probably. It is the most beautiful state in the country. Period. No contest. Absolutely no contest. Yeah. Hey, hey. Everyone who says they can't come because of the cold, it's I'm the exact opposite. I, I miss winter and it's days like today that have me, if it weren't for the news, considering driving to Canada for a week or two <laughs> till it cools down. Um, but it, it really is beautiful. One of the best drives you'll ever take in your life is up through the notch on your way to Port Fest from Manchester. So on that note, like great. you know, people complain about global warming. I don't really see that as a bad thing being in New Hampshire now. Like, who cares? If it's <laughs> Know, and it's yep. a little bit warmer in the summer it's pretty nice here man like I, i'm not complaining at all like i'm definitely complaining when i'm working outside in the 115 degree heat of sacramento i'm not complaining here it might be a little bit more humid it might get a little bit more wet in the winter time and a little bit more snow but like i got here right after some snowstorms and it will it's not that bad guys just like pick up a shovel get it off your driveway you can still live your life they plow the roads pretty well here so oh yeah it's all easy to find or you can pay your neighbor he'll come in and plow your driveway for you or give him some alcohol that usually works too yes, the free market will find a way <laughs> oh yeah it's super easy 
we went years with just paying a guy in booze to plow our driveway for us or get a snowblower. It's easy to defeat uh, cold weather. Yeah. You just booed him while I did it. Boo, boo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Bill, why are you such a California disrespecter, dude? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you it's know, so easy. Mainly just the, the the ethos of California. I actually I spent some time in California. I, I like it. I think it's a beautiful place. Um, the taxes are ridiculous. The laws are ridiculous. Um, they just ban like didn't they ban like electric mo or I'm sorry gas yep. mowers and blowers <laughs> yeah. like leaf blowers and weed whackers and stuff. Within like, the next couple of years, yeah, they're not going to be allowed to use gas powered machinery for like. What are they going to ban? Gas generators, which I know, like, there's a whole off grid community <laughs> in Northern California that like is really trying to do the agorist thing that does a pretty good job uh, in my experience. Um, I, if they ban gas generators, like what are those going to do? It's like, you know, forcing yeah. people into solar or whatever that is not necessarily efficient or money saving. Um, and the, yeah, a lot I, of people I mean, use those stuff anyway. Sorry, so we ahead. use gas generators all the time. And the um, crazy amount of effect that's going to have economically on small businesses or startup businesses is insane. Uh, what it's going to do to more corporatize or monopoly type businesses is um yeah they're going to be able to pay it but uh it's just not it's not a good thing like it, it's um like gas prices out there already just like the other week i saw it, like my buddy sent me a screenshot his gas was like eight dollars and 65 cents a gallon Jeez. they have well, a gas tax out there of 65 cents well what about the economic impact of going electric the economic imp the environmental impact of going green is something a lot of people don't talk about and it's something i think californians are just like willfully blind to as to consider this um there is somebody he's not a libertarian by any means but michael schellenberger who is uh someone who i became familiar with because of his nuclear energy activism is running for governor in california right now or i don't know if they just had their primary and he got trounced or not but he's been running on a ending green energy platform because he's like presenting all the math he's like green energy relies so much on battery storage in order for it to be functional that if we were to get rid of all gasoline powered cars in california and make everybody drive electric there is not actually enough battery storage in the united states to power california's grid for more than seven minutes yeah and they don't want to keep using nuclear power like that would be horrible right but right um you know it's crazy the amount of subsidies that go into this market and um uh <laughs> i mean yeah it's, it's absolutely insane the economic impact is is catastrophic like in my opinion issue number one before they do anything is the uh you know the unfunded liabilities crisis that they are involved in right now like in the next five to ten years there's gonna be a lot of state employees retiring that they cannot afford to pay <clears throat> and that's a very big problem they're literally like uh you know they, they they claim to have all this stuff under there's already been several cities that have gone bankrupt and they cannot pay people their pensions when there's enough cities doing that and they cannot pay out pensions. You thought two years ago was that when they were breaking into buildings and burning things down. Like I can't even imagine, especially if they decide to. Uh, uh, well, California is no stranger to riots. Wait no, it's not. City it's not by any means. Doing it. But especially if they try to enact some kind of crazy gun legislation to, um, you know, limit people's ability to protect themselves and, and stuff like that, like people people don't realize how bad the unfunded liability crisis is that's looming they literally cannot afford to pay people's pensions that is a horrible thing horrible so it's pretty irresponsible as a state to be paying yeah. much people on you know especially that many people so like the california has what the the most well, California has been seeing a big exodus too. Like uh, New Hampshire was among the top states in gaining a new population of people moving to New Hampshire as a percentage uh, at the last census. California was the biggest loser. Like California lost, I think, multiple congressional seats in the last portion. Yeah. And like the last time, I, I, don't, I can't even think of the last time a state lost multiple congressional seats in the single uh, census because that's an 
they're basically equivalent to losing the population of two entire states with Wyoming and Alaska yeah. from California in 10 years. Um, they have where are they going? With the COVID regime too. So, <laughs> well, I mean, where are they going? I mean, they're going to mostly Texas and Florida, which is already pretty purple. I mean, Ron DeSantis didn't mean by that much. So all these people going to Florida, like uh, for some reason, I don't feel like most of them are, uh, you know, left individuals that are leaving, but um, it's not well because to the, immigration, the immigration, the immigration from principles. California to Austin, Texas, have been like pr pretty clear. Like, there's a direct correlation, or maybe not a causation. I don't want to say correlation is causation, but there's a direct correlation between migration from California to Austin, Texas, and the increase in the Democratic vote share in Austin, Texas. So, like, it's Democrats leaving California. It's people who vote blue, who vote progressive, who are leaving California. What does that bode for Cali for Texas and Florida? What does that bode the same for the thing other semi-free states? Voted for Colorado. The exact yeah. same thing. Like, Colorado has has politically become a complete nightmare. Um, they've tried to pass all kinds of like you know anti-gun legislation. You know, they 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 did pass recreational weed before California ever did, which was cool. But, um, you know, they shut, they'll shut down, you know, psilocybin in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? They just wanted the tax money from that. So well, that's uh, what I was going to say. How much do they tax it? What's crazy is when they passed all this, like they had um, I believe they had mentioned that they wanted it all to go to the schools, like the tax money. But the federal government. I believe rolled that they can't give drug money to schools. So, <laughs> so that. it goes just to strictly to politicians. Yeah, well, it's a complete new. Drug. Aren't they lowering the taxes? <laughs> Didn't California just have a legislative push to actually lower the taxes on cannabis because they were non-competitive with the black market and they were losing market share to criminals? I did hear that. Yes, I don't know for sure, but uh, uh, that would make sense because yes, there's only only the government could lose money selling weed. <laughs> you know, <what> I mean? <laughs> <That's true. laughs> like, would this be the first instance of the Californian state legislature like showing any kind of brain cell activity in what they're doing, as far as like the, you know, understanding the free market and economics and like saying we need to reduce taxes because we can't compete? I mean, yeah, they, I mean, I, it probably <laughs> is. I mean, every time you get a, a thing to vote on, you know, it's like every you, you read through it, it's like this will increase your taxes by this much. And they pass with like these overwhelming numbers. And I'm like that. I mean, that's probably the only thing that they've had that's lower taxes in the last like five years. So. <laughs> yeah, now I'm tempted to look it up, but it, it, it's mind blowing to me because um, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, I, there isn't actually any prohibition on like a private liquor store opening in New Hampshire. Uh, like the state of New Hampshire has a monopoly on liquor sales, but like mm -hmm. there, there are one or two private liquor stores that do exist in the state. They just exist in areas where the state liquor store isn't competing with them. So they have the ability to compete. The state liquor stores maintain their monopoly because they just don't pay the taxes and they don't charge any kind of taxes at the state liquor store. Um, uh, so like th that's how the state maintains its monopoly on liquor in New Hampshire is just by not taxing themselves. So you think like if New Hampshire figured that out a century ago, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. what's keeping California, Massachusetts, Colorado, and all these legal pot states from figuring that out? I mean, and, and the biggest the biggest difference for me since I moved here is like, absolutely the tax burden is just ridiculously lower just in general. Like you're talking about taxes at the liquor store. Like, yeah, you don't pay taxes on liquor. You don't pay taxes on almost anything. So, um, there's still tax, but coming from California, paying like an astronomical percentage of my checks in tax. Um, sure, their property tax percentage is lower, but you're also paying way more for your house there like you're gonna get like um a two hundred fifty thousand dollar new hampshire house for seven hundred thousand dollars in california so the percentage does not is a completely irrelevant number right uh but you know you, we don't pay the sales tax here there's no state income tax i can go from california to new hampshire making the same amount of money or less 
and I'm going to be walking home and spending less money and keeping more of my paychecks. Uh, that's been a huge noticeable difference and it's been amazing. Honestly, like I, I wasn't expecting to be able to keep so much of my money. I, I, awesome. That's a pretty cool feature of New Hampshire. So <laughs> now, that is a good feature. Now, Ben, you've been in California and in the past and since you moved to New Hampshire, you've been very, very involved in the Libertarian Party. We've already touched that and mm -hmm. as a Libertarian activist within the Libertarian Party. One thing a lot of free staters struggle with is accepting the Libertarian Party as a viable vehicle for liberty when we have such a successful Republican liberty movement here in New Hampshire and when there are multiple dues paying and lifetime members of the Libertarian Party sitting in our legislature as Republicans actually accomplishing legislative change to increase liberty in our lifetime here in New Hampshire, while libertarians in the Libertarian Party are floundering, failing, and losing elections every year. Um, you recently went to Reno this past weekend uh, as a Californian delegate uh, to the National Convention, um, but there was big changes, big upside. What do you think the future of the Libertarian Party is nationally here in new hampshire what's its place in the liberty movement and how did things kind of shape out and change this weekend that might impact uh people's perception of that and do you think maybe there's a different role for the libertarian party to play than conventional electoral politics here in new hampshire that free staters can get behind what i think is the future of the libertarian party is um not focusing on only chasing votes but grassroots community activism because that's where things actually get done um but honestly the energy that um these new libertarians they're they're ron paul revolution 2.0 libertarians coming into the party in in droves um and that same energy that all these people had during ron paul's campaign uh back in you know 2008 12 that's being transferred in. There's like a, a completely new wave of this going on right now. People are very excited. They want to hit the streets. They want to get things done. If they run as a libertarian or Republican, like I, I, I would encourage them to run libertarian. Um, I'm not going to like be upset if someone here in New Hampshire decided they wanted to go and, and throw their name in as an R because I mean, Justin Amash did that and he did, he was probably like one of the best, you know, congressman of our of our lifetime, you know what I mean, in terms of how he voted and everything, you know, but um, he started as Republican. He was Republican um, in name only for, you know, probably 10 years, but he was very open. That's one thing he talked about at convention. He's very open about how he would always talk about how he's a libertarian. And he was many times like one of the only no votes, you know what I mean, on certain legislations that were trying to be passed. Our enemy is not with people who want to protect our freedoms. We are trying to push back and roll back the state's oversight over every single thing that we're doing. Um, so I like that. Rejoined LP immediately after Reno was set. And you know what? We had so many new lifetime members after this weekend. I think that they said that there were over like $200,000 worth of lifetime memberships that came in just this last weekend. So, um, the money is going to start cycling. Like, there's a lot of people that left the Libertarian Party. Um, people are going to start putting their money where their mouth is. And um, uh, people like myself um, or, you know, even like you guys or other Libertarians here, it's time for us to get to work in our communities. You know, like we have these races, Senate, Governor, but there's these other races, you know, on, on a was 400 state assemblymen in the state of New Hampshire. There's not a reason that we can't be out there trying to get all of those state seats. Like I, I think this is the place where libertarians can win. So I versus California, like libertarians can win in New Hampshire. One of the reasons the Free State Project chose New Hampshire, and it was a long reason. In fact, there was 101 of the reasons in the original video. Um, New Hampshire, Alaska, Vermont, and Maine were the only states to have ever elected a libertarian at that point in time uh, to a state legislature. And Alaska, Vermont, and Maine had each done it one time, and New Hampshire had done it about 12. So the it was the existing libertarian culture of the people here in New Hampshire that allowed the early libertarian party of the late 80s and early 90s and early 2000s before the Free State Project to have moderate modicums of success here in New Hampshire. 
Um, and there's nothing to say that can't be done again in the future. There's nothing to say that the huge uptick in free staters swinging the Republican Party in such a pro-liberty direction isn't going to lead to an official split of the state GOP at some point. Where yeah, no, that's not the people we're fighting. Picked up. We can talk about yeah. minarchy versus anarchy when we get there. Yeah. We're not there. Yeah. So <laughs> let's get to minarchy, and then we'll talk about rolling it back a little bit more, right? Um, you know, the, we have the best representation per tax citizen in the entire United States here in New Hampshire. And um, while we don't want the taxes at all, um, still we're, we have the best opportunity than anywhere in the country. If you want to come here and make a difference in your community, you can get on as a selectman with your local community. You can get on at, um, you know, the school board or budget committee. And, um, you know, we had like Croydon school district situation, you know, not too long ago, slashing the school budgets, obviously it didn't last, but, um, you know, like there's so many opportunities for libertarians to make a difference here. Um, whereas, you know, you can, you can do all these cool things running for city council or supervisor in California, which I think is the future of the libertarian party. I do not think it is in Senate and Congress quite yet. It could get there, but only after they see the proof is in the pudding, right? Like, you know, like you, they have to know, like, oh, look at what this council, what city council is doing. They have three out of five members as a libertarian right now, and and they're coming out with budget surpluses and all this stuff. You know, what I mean, like uh, th that stuff is in the future, but uh, we yeah. have the best chance of it right here in New Hampshire. It's happening, so we're winning. We're way ahead, I think. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're ahead of the game. So, but the game doesn't slow down. And I, I mean, what do you necessarily think the next steps need to be then? Because we've seen the Libertarian Party here in New Hampshire over the past few years kind of take a pivoting approach, focusing more on that stuff like local grassroots activism, community cleanups, community involvement, doing the nonprofit stuff, and building a name and a reputation of libertarianism in the community. While we've seen free staters take the political approach within the Republican Party uh, and do the immediate need, the immediate protection of our liberty, the immediate advancement of liberty in our lifetime time here in New Hampshire, what do you think the next step is to bring those kind of two goals closer into line to, um, because like I said, what's the place for the Libertarian Party long term, because, it, or is there even a place for the Libertarian Party long term if the political success is all entirely on the Republican Party? Is there a need for a party with the Libertarian Party in New Hampshire? Uh, and I say this as a member, as a lifetime yeah. member of the Libertarian Party, I openly question sometimes, is there actually a need for it here in this state? There's definitely a need for it in other states. Um, is our is there maybe a role in keeping politicians accountable uh, for maybe primarying the bad Republicans, going after uh, the people who don't support liberty and like doing targeted, instead of trying to go after all 400 seats, maybe just go after yeah. 30 or 40 of the worst ones? Yeah. I mean, there's an argument there to be made. Um, I mean, we have NHLA here, which does a right. great job of keeping people accountable and, uh, you know, grading people on how they vote and, you know, making recommendations of legislation that's coming up of how people in, in you know, on their ballots can be voting and stuff like that. But um, it just, you know, I, I actually just heard this argument this weekend at the convention, you know, people talking about like, well, all of this money was funneled into a convention. I mean, myself, I probably paid close to $2,000 to get there half the weekend, right? Like economically total. We're talking probably like million plus dollars for sure. Like from all these people that flew from all over the country, not to mention the direct convention costs. What if that money was being put towards directly funding these campaigns to help local communities? Like it, it makes sense. I'm not like, you know, uh, throwing that idea out the table. However, like I truly believe Libertarian Party is the vehicle um, that's going to get us to where we we need to be, um, especially now that we have a competent board of people who um, aren't scared to say things that might offend somebody. Like that's like the, one of the biggest uh I guess twist of the whole thing is like, you know, while we're not going to like be straight out there just trolling, trolling people, like we have a responsibility to tell the truth. And there hasn't been a, like, uh, there's been truth that's the libertarian has been a truthful party 
for the most part. But I'm saying like, you know, we need to tell the truth and not be scared to like call out the COVID regime. The Libertarian Party was very abysmal oh. on the COVID regime. So uh, I think you're touching on uh, on something that really is set in with me this weekend. And uh, it, so the drama surrounding the Libertarian Party convention and li like how it represents the core of the Libertarian movement here in the United States. And I hate to say it, but the Libertarian Party is representative of the Libertarian movement because the vast majority of people in this country who don't see beyond the surface, they don't look beyond the surface and do their own research, do any research beyond the surface and headlines. Whatever the Libertarian Party says is what Libertarians believe regardless of what us libertarians in New Hampshire and libertarians in Massachusetts have dramatic differences in opinion on things, um, what the Libertarian Party is saying, what Justin Amash is saying, is what the average American thinks is the representation of libertarianism. And that's why I think it's really important as free staters that we kind of care what the Libertarian National Party is doing, even if we're not necessarily involved in it, because we still have to answer for it. Um, when we frame, when we pose ourselves as libertarians when we promote libertarian ideology, even if what the libertarian party is promoting is the antithesis of libertarian ideology, we then have to answer for that mix, that uh, misstep and that bad take. And at the same time, um, we have such little influence in it because so few people are involved in it. And I've taken to see, like there was the Mises caucus and the takeover in Reno has been a four-year building process over multiple conventions and recruiting and growing organizations within the party. And the big fight has been over messaging, marketing, and platform and how the Libertarian Party presents itself. And that was the crux of the whole bit of the drama. And there are some people who are very, very upset that the more kind of right-leaning, property rights-centric Mises Caucus libertarians, people who many free staters openly identify with and as and agree with their messaging, have taken control of the Libertarian Party. And a lot of the old garden leadership have been, like, made me almost want to bring back the weekly update that we used to do for the show, um, where just kind of screaming into the abyss of the pain and, like some kind of existential agony they've been seeing at losing control over a political party social media accounts. But the reality is their whole pitch was that our brand of libertarianism doesn't appeal to the general public. Well, if their brand of a libertarianism appealed to the general public, how come they weren't able to get enough people involved to stop 700 people? Pod, frat boys with podcasts who went to Reno to take over a party. Can because I just say that you're wrong, though? Like, there's not just 700 Mises Caucus members. We are and, like, that were delegates there yes, in the we, spot. Yeah, we're right. the ones who are trying to get on um, right. the XComs and the the city, you know, the county affiliates to right. to help grow. Um, and that's a big thing. Is like, you know, we are sick and tired. Like, if you cannot say what you want to say. Um, well, to that point, and you can't say what you want to say to finish my point. I think Bill has something to add to it. Yeah, I want to if hear from Bill. If you're not insulting somebody, if you're not offending somebody, if you're not speaking your truth of liberty in, in a way that frightens someone, then you're not doing it right, in my opinion. I mean, and who because cares if you I, do? We have freedom of association. Well, because I, I, I honestly believe, and I think Jeremy Kaufman is 100% correct when he says, the, the reason the path to libertarian success is concentration is because there aren't enough libertarians. There are not enough of us. There are not okay. enough people who share our values for you, us to appeal to a general public. This is this is what okay. So to go back to what Ben said like uh, yeah. a couple minutes ago is like saying the unpopular thing is the most important thing. Like you know, appealing to the masses. You're never going to appeal to the masses as a libertarian. The masses aren't libertarians. So so then it's like saying the unpopular thing gets the people who are in the masses who are surrounded by people who are like of the masses thinking like wow this is fucking crazy you know saying the unpopular thing then it doesn't get it doesn't get everything right it doesn't get everybody on board but it gets the people who matter on board and then it's like new hampshire will never be the most popular state you know florida has way more miles of beaches oh my god have you heard of sunshine it's amazing. We have it all year. Okay, sure. That's cool. But like also you have taxes all fucking year. Or you have, you know, whatever is going on in Florida that you have red flag laws, all that you know, I can go down the list, but yeah. it's never gonna be the most popular idea. 
and it's never been the most popular state, but it will be the most popular idea and the most popular state to the right people. And so you have to say the things that are true. And so people yes. who who and, agree and, with you, who, who value truth, will then collect around you and they will find you and they will rally around that. And then you have a place, but you need a place, like you're talking about the representation, where that actually matters. So I don't know. Like, like be willing to, to right. piss people off. That's as like much as thing. as I much as we need a libertarian concentration, and we need a libertarian homeland, and we need libertarian to all get together and like embrace libertarianism and make libertarianism work. Socialists also need a socialist homeland and a socialist paradise where they can all go get together and they can have California. There's no guns. Like, there's going to be back. no question. We will trade. We will trade every libertarian in California for every liber- for every socialist in the rest of the damn country. I don't care. It might even no. I'll, that's not I'll even say true. this. <laughs> One of the biggest points of contention this last um, weekend at the con- at the convention was when we were talking about the line that has been on our you know our platform or whatever for a very long time. We contemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant, right? The, by definition, bigotry is just intolerance um, towards somebody who has a different opinion than yourself. That is not libertarian at all. In <laughs> fact, the people who are fighting to keep that were being bigots towards the Mises caucus. <clears throat> They're being very intolerant towards people of a different opinion. So um, well, if you can't say what you want because you're scared to offend somebody or lose your job, that is like... I don't know, it's happening all over the country. Like, you know, people are losing their jobs for their opinions. And um, that shouldn't be a thing. You know, there comes a time when I'm like, yeah, sure, shut shut the hell up. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't want to hear from you anymore. But we can associate with who we want. That's what makes this country great and, and this culture great. So um, I have not been afraid to speak my mind here in New Hampshire so far. Um, I will say that in California... There were times that I would have to bite my tongue quite often because uh, I was <laughs> representing a, a company that uh, I could get in trouble. Like, for instance, you're not allowed to call things manholes. I work in the storm drain industry. <laughs> yeah, That's a real or thing. utility holes or or uh, entry or, or uh, um, access points at this point but oh so man ridiculous. that's funny oh, no. you can still I, I make that dirty yeah. I mean, you can still make those things all dirty yeah, no, yeah. I, I've oh, gained yeah, quite yeah. a bit. I've gained quite a bit of notoriety on Twitter for just being outlandish and attacking brand celebrities and having crazy Twitter and saying a like really radical shit on Twitter that scares people and frightens people a lot of times. And I used to worry about, is this going to affect my job? Am I going to get a, but I've been fortunate enough to find a job here in New Hampshire where everyone in my office follows me on Twitter and around lunchtime half, uh, like every other day, somebody's like, Hey, Justin, can you go like harass Domino's into giving us free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and people know that I'm just that kind of a character on Twitter, and they're like, "Hey, the brands are scared." Of you. I got everyone free coffee for a month from Dunkin' Donuts for <laughs> customer service issues, nice. and they're like, "Can you attack another brand and get us free food for a month?" It's like it's great. Try Chipotle nice. next. Just go down a list. No, next, next on my list is uh, Christian fried chicken. <laughs> uh, because there's a Chick Fil A down the street from my office, and we're gonna see if we can't get nuggets for a month. Hey, so now do you actually wait? Never mind. This is not free state relevant. I was gonna say, do you wait for a bad, a bad experience first, or you just call them and complain? So that's not, yeah. This, this well, it's this I've never done it without ethics, a bad Justin, experience. Ethics. Yeah, I've never done it without a bad experience. But like, I had an issue with Dunkin' Donuts, and where I can't, I went through the drive-through, and they wouldn't put. Um, the cream cheese on my bagel I ordered, and I was just, I was in a bad mood. I'm not a morning person to begin with, and I uh, i came to the conclusion, I'm like, listen, if I'm sitting in the drive-thru ordering a bagel with cream cheese on it, I think the assumption should be implied that I want the cream cheese on the bagel, so I can eat it before I get to my destination. I don't want to have to pull over to apply the damn cream cheese. So you give me a cup of cream cheese and a knife, instead of just taking the extra four seconds of your time in the back to put the cream cheese on the bagel, is asinine. 
And so I tweeted something along the lines of Dunkin' Donuts employees fighting for a raise in the minimum wage is terrifying when they can't be bothered to do simple basic tasks like spread cream cheese. I'm sorry, but some people just don't deserve a living wage. <laughs> and Dunkin' Donuts was in my DMs in minutes, apologizing and begging for information and gave us free coffee for a month. Nice. And that would never happen in California. Uh <laughs> No, you'd have to go apologize to the server for insulting her on Twitter, and then you'd have to pay extra <laughs> tips for a month in California. Yeah. yeah. No, but, the, the, the biggest thing for Reno and for me, we watched the whole thing this weekend, and it is just – I'm not an LP guy, or I don't – voting is stupid. Um, but the whole thing has been so fun and entertaining to watch all of the reing and all of the, the nightmare that this thing has been. <laughs> So this weekend for me watching it was a big culmination and a lot of like just a train wreck of a huge political disaster. And now I'm like, oh no, they you guys might what if you guys actually do a great job? Like what if the Mises Caucus really is just does a good job and continues like messaging that's effective? There's the, a plan, man. I've got I've yeah. got Oh, I've heard the pitch. It's yeah, yeah, it's it's a hundred percent. Well, it's but, wild. Yeah, yeah. It's wild even just to see the past. 20, 24 hours of what's happened like the previous libertarian national committee the people who ran the libertarian party it, they preached the preach to the masses not to libertarians we want to get votes not convert libertarians it's about winning votes and affecting public policy not making libertarians libertarian again and freeing a world in our lifetime it was about getting vote share that's all they cared about and so they ran a watered down milk toast messaging and Donors fled the party, and they blamed the Mises Caucus and radical libertarians who spoke radical messaging for driving away donors. And they left the party with a substantial debt because they couldn't fundraise. They overspent. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on projects that accomplished nothing um, and like wasted all that donor money that they did have. And in 24 hours, uh, the new National Committee was able to raise over a quarter million dollars just from new memberships. Yeah, it's absolutely it's to pay great, off the debt. Wait, it was yeah. Over a quarter of a million in a yep. weekend. Wow. No, just after the elections. Yeah, and it's insane. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and a lot of that was lifetime memberships coming in. Like it's absolutely crazy. There's like a record high number of new member, new lifetime members after this. Uh, Interesting convention. So, um, yeah, it was it was quite the sight to see. There was a lot of reading, a lot of reading. Um, I've been trolling the crap out of several uh, certain New Hampshire uh, losers that try to affiliate with the Libertarian Party all weekend. It's been fun. I am, I've been having such a good time. Um, but <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Why? That's yeah, it's funny. Um, but yes, like I'm, I'm telling you, like there is a plan. Angela is the person to take this party and get it started going in the right direction who knows how long she's going to want to do that um you know i i could never do that that's a crazy task to put on your shoulders but um i have worked with her for like the last two years i'm on a pack with her on a board with her um in california and um Ooh. i know that she is going to lead the way she leads by example and she does a fantastic job she used to lead a law firm and um, she's going to basically treat the LP the way it, it, it should have been all this time. You know, there's no more <coughs> crazy astronomical debts. They're not going to be selling the libertarian headquarters. Um, but uh, yeah, so buy one in New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what I said. Well, <laughs> A great recap of the weekend, great uh, outlook on the future of the Liberty Movement and the Libertarian Party as becoming a net positive for such a Liberty Movement, uh, while maintaining a place alongside what we're doing here in the Free State Project in New Hampshire. 
Um, but if you guys want to learn more, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Ben, for joining and everybody at home for watching yet another episode of Free State Live. If you want to learn more about the Free State Project, as always, fsp.org is our website where you can check it out. You can learn more about what we're doing, how to get involved. Uh, if you're going to visit New Hampshire, check out the Visit New Hampshire page with all the tips, tricks on where to go, when to schedule. Get in touch with Chris Lopez and she can help you plan your trip and plan your visit. She's phenomenal and our volunteers and staff do an excellent job of making sure everyone is uh gets the best experience when they do get here and if you're already here um or you're visiting or you're passing through and you want to get in touch with like local libertarians and see what it's like what's it like on the ground here we mentioned the calendar this is an event that happens every day an event that happens all over the state at every moment with check out fsp.org slash calendar where you can find out where you can get involved with your future neighbors at any time and meet the community because they'll make you want to stay and when you do plan your move check out the welcome wagon they'll help you unpack and all you get to pay is pizza so it's been a fun show thank you for tuning in everybody ben any final thoughts for everybody if you're putting your money anywhere um I would say this is the weekend to go to lp.org slash donate and sign up for a monthly recurring donation because we are putting our money where our mouth is. The Libertarian is now party has now been taken over by Ron Paul Libertarians and we're excited. We are we're ready to do uh, the work that needs done. I myself am about to step up my game more than I ever have and stay more busy than I ever have. So um, yes. Go check out what's going on and um yeah, put your money where your where your mouth is and where your heart is. So fantastic. Well, thank you for coming in. Everybody remember the Free State Project is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit that does not and cannot explicitly endorse any legislation, candidates, or political parties or political organizations engaged in the act of politics or influencing elections. All information presented here is for informational purposes only. And if you want to help give to the Free State Project, as always, it's fsp.org slash give. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of our community, our friends, our family. And until next time, be free. Live free or die. Don't let the freedom pass you by. Stand up proud and strong and lead this country on. Live free or die. From the village green to the mountains high. Yankee voices sing the song of liberty. In 1623, she touched the hand of history and led the colonies on. Independence was won. And the spirit lives today to guide America on her way. New Hampshire standing free, the home of liberty. Live free or die, don't let the freedom pass you by. Stand up proud.